Hi everyone, welcome to the Conversation Project Community Call, where this week we're going to be focusing on National Healthcare Decisions Day. My name is Naomi Fedna, and I'm the project coordinator for the Conversation Project, and we'll be starting in just a few minutes. We're just going to give some folks time to call in. Hi everyone and happy Wednesday. I hope that you all are having a great week. My name is Naomi Fedna and I'm the project coordinator for the um, the conversation project, and I'll be your WebEx host. So while we're waiting for people to log in and get onto the WebEx platform, um, I'm just going to run through a few WebEx tips and tricks. So if you have a question or a comment at any point during the call, feel free to type it in to the chat box at the bottom of your screen and send it to all participants. So under the chat box, there's a drop-down menu and just click all participants. And if you have a question, there's um, a small icon of a hand where you can virtually raise your hand and it's located on the right hand side of the box um, of the screen and we can call on you to, so you can voice your question. And if you're having any technical difficulties or you need to ask me any questions to um, maybe help you get access to the slides if they freeze or anything, um, just chat directly to the host and I'll be able to help you out. All right, Kate, I'm going to pass it on to you. Great, thanks so much, Naomi. This is 
Kate DeBartolo calling in from Washington, D.C., and we are so excited to see, I get over about 115 people on the line so far. I was hoping you could use the chat feature so that we can get familiar with it to type into all participants, how did you learn about this call? So maybe you got it from an email, a peer told you about it. Um, we just want to get people used to using the, the chat feature. And just a quick note to our presenters, if you could please mute your lines um, so that we, we don't hear any background noise as well. So I see a mix of email, conversation project website, through um, the National Healthcare Decision Day website. Isn't it amazing how email is really the king of all? Well, thank you for sharing that. And then the other thing that we would love to do is if everybody can see above where I've got my little pointer right here on the left-hand side, if you click on that arrow and then you can click on the map to show where it is you are calling in from, we would love to get a sense of where people are joining us from. Looks like we've got a mix of people who are joining us at 3 p.m., others who are calling in and it's more like, I guess it's kind of a lunchtime call for you on the West Coast. A good point, too. People can, can chat into the um, chat in where you're calling in from, too. We always love to know if you've got a group with you or maybe you're calling in from a congregation or from a hospital. So any information that helps fill in the blanks for us since we've got so many groups that are joining. Sacramento, Baton Rouge, Little Rock. Wonderful. Lynn, I'm also calling in from Washington, D.C. For those of you, I think everybody's having some unseasonably warm weather, but it's about 75 degrees here today, so we're excited to have that. All right, so with that, I'm going to move us along. So thank you, everybody, for chiming in on the chat. I love to see the mix of where people are joining us from. Um, what we're planning on covering today is just to give you a little bit of overview on National Healthcare Decisions Day. You're going to hear from the founder, Nathan Kotkamp, as well as three different groups around the country who have been planning efforts. They did it last year. They're planning for this year. Just to give you a sense of, of what you could be taking on and, and to get some of your feedback and questions. So we hope that we'll have time not only for you to hear from these different presenters, but also to ask questions or to use the chat to share what you're going to be doing as well. Um, as a little bit of background, the Conversation Project for many of you, I think many of you are familiar with it, but if you're not, it's a large national public engagement initiative to ensure that everybody's wishes for care at the end of life both expressed and respected. And we love having National Healthcare Decisions Day, week, month, however you want to treat it, to really draw attention to the importance of this and how do we get people to break these taboos and think about what their wishes are for their healthcare um, and how do they document that and how do they talk about it with their loved ones or with their providers. So we really appreciate this opportunity to have a, a national holiday, if you will. Um, so today you'll hear from groups around the country on what they've done, and my, my biggest hope is that this really sparks ideas for you. There is no one-size-fits-all approach to doing this, and what you hear from Baptist Health down in southern Florida um, might be exactly the kind of facility you're joining from. It could be totally different, but maybe some of the things they're doing in the community or with their employees um, will spark some ideas for you. So hopefully you've got your notebook out and, and can jot down some of the things that you're thinking about. Um, you can put your questions and ideas into the chat so that we can keep the conversation going there. And I want to quickly, I'll be your MC, but I want to quickly turn it over to Nathan Kotkamp so he can share a little bit more with you about kind of how this all got started and, and where he sees things going before we hear from our community leaders. So, Nathan, I'll hand it off to you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I am going to try and be really brief because I really want to hear from the community providers. Um, but yeah, so National Healthcare Decisions Day uh, is now in its 11th year. Uh, we celebrated their 10th anniversary last year with a week-long event that many of the participants took advantage of. Um, and we're doing the same this year. Information about that's on the website. You don't have to do it that way. Um, but just by way of background, many of you guys already know this, but um, 
this all really started because I served on several hospital ethics committees and saw the lack of advanced care planning uh, as a recurring issue, and I got sick and tired of hearing it uh, and decided to try and do something about it. So the goal was to try to create an engagement event around the country for uh, interdisciplinary action to take place about advanced care planning. And it is not just the healthcare community, it's not just the legal community, it's the faith community, it's um, private groups, it's uh, book clubs, it's uh, families sitting down at kitchen tables and in, in, in living rooms and dining rooms and things like that. Um, so. Just some basics, April 16, uh, in honor of Ben Franklin's little adage that nothing in life is certain but death and taxes, that's the reason we chose that date. Um, it actually is tax day this year, um, but again, keep, keep the week-long event in your mind and you can uh, do with it what you will. Um, the website is nhdd.org. Um, most of you, I think, are getting our uh, newsletters, and if you're not, make sure to go to the nhdd.org website um, and click on so that you get, uh, we send a monthly email on the 16th of every month just to keep you apprised and give you some, some things to think about and uh, hopefully spur you on and, and uh, really encourage you to do some of the things that we're going to hear about in just a moment. So uh, just our, our results so far, um, it's been huge. Uh, in 10 years, uh, hundreds of, of, well over 100 national organizations, uh, several thousands of state and local organizations. We've had military participation in, in combat uh, zones across the world, which is just amazing to me. Uh, and then the numbers in terms of folks who've been affected in one way or the other uh, are, are staggering. They're in the millions. One time we even trended on Twitter, which is an amazing feed if you know anything about that. Um, and although it's not just about creating documents, we do know that um, over uh, 37,000 documents have been completed on the National Healthcare Decision Days alone. So it's something for all of us to be very, very proud of, and obviously we want to build on those numbers um, in a variety of different ways. So um, when at a high level, the ways that, the, the, that I look at building on those types of things is, first of all, leading by example. Um, hopefully everyone on this call has already done their own advanced care planning, but I'm willing to bet that they haven't. Um, so step one is do your own and then share it. L let people know that you're doing it. Encourage them to do it. Um, you don't have to share the specifics of what your wishes are. Um, just say that you have created a plan, that you've given a gift to your loved ones, uh, and encourage other people to do the same. I've gotten some notes today um, that there's a whole bunch of NHDD activity going on on Facebook right now. So um, that's a great place to encourage people to um, take, ac take action. Um, is as a provider, I think it's also absolutely essential for your job function. I think you can't, um, you can't do a good job of advanced care planning and discussing this with patients if you haven't been through it yourself. It doesn't mean you're going to ever uh, necessarily come up with the same choices as your patients will, but simply going through the exercise is something that's vitally important in, in terms of being a, a professional. So talk with others about it. Um, volunteer to speak. This is a topic that um, that lots of groups are hungry for information about. Um, in most places, you don't have to be worried about um, an unauthorized practice of law or anything if you're just giving basic information, and particularly if you're doing so in the context of a healthcare provider, then, then you're certainly going to be good to go. Uh, and collaborate. This is a great opportunity to get different providers, different organizations. Um, it's, it's, a, it's just such a wonderful opportunity to do things in a collaborative, collaborative fashion. Um, so we, we strongly, strongly encourage that. Uh, and then share the resources. If you want to take the things from the NHDD website and share them, then great. Otherwise, share what you've got. Make sure that uh, this information is saturating the world in and around April 16. Um, also, don't forget, it's about you professionally. It is about you personally. So everything that we do, um, we're all potential patients at, at, at any given point. So do it on April 16. Do it any time of the year. It doesn't really matter. And all those resources are there uh, throughout the year. So um, that's just a little bit of background on, on where we came from, what we're, what we're doing, my wishes as to what um, some high-level things you can do. But now I know we're going to um, turn to some really specifics and some great initiatives that we're going to hear about. If you ever need me, here's my contact information, and I am going to hand over the reins. Thank you so much, Nathan, and thank you for 
the A, starting this, B, being such a good steward of this and keeping the energy up for so many years and always being willing to join us and helping promote this. Um, it's uh, been it's exciting to me. Yeah, you know, the numbers that you share are just so impressive that if we get each of these 141 folks on the line today to either do their own advanced directives or invite this to their book club or bring it to their employees, that's really what gets the snowball rolling. So really appreciate all that you've done to help get that started. Here, here. So with that, um, Naomi, maybe you can advance to the next slide. Um, to be sure, I think that we're going to have Leah going first um, from Arizona, who's going to be able to share with us what's been going on um, on the West Coast. Um, and Naomi, just want to make sure we can get the, the slides going. So, Rhea, if you are able to advance one slide, we'll be able to see your sunshiny face or slide, I believe. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'm looking to make sure I know which button to click here. It's right, at least on my screen, it's above to the, to the right of the number 12. Do you see that up at the top where there's a little right-hand button that you can push to the next page? Let's see here. And if not, we can make sure that we oh. answer for you. Let's see, I think I got it. Did that work? It didn't. I think oh, it, um, I yeah. found it. There you go, you did it. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon from Arizona. My name is Rhea Go Coloma, and I'm the Executive Director for Hospice of the West in Phoenix. Um, I'm really humbled to be on this call today. And um, before I share our about our campaign and our program, um, I'd like to give you some history on how we got to the, this point. So um, a little bit about myself. I'm an, I, my background is I came from an inpatient unit setting in hospice. And um, as a licensed uh, master social worker, it was pretty common um, for me to have conversations with patients and families on a daily basis um, about advanced care planning, the importance of it, and the execution of it. Um, when I um, joined Hospice of the West, so this was seven years ago, I took a poll at that time, actually it was not quite at the, the, big, the first year, but two years later, I took a poll with our staff to determine how many of us had completed our advanced directives. And I was surprised um, to find that it was a pretty low percentage. I began asking other community members if um, they were finding the same thing within their staff um, at their organizations and pretty much got similar answers as to the low numbers of healthcare professionals not having done their, their documents and also not knowing how to have the conversation and when to have it. And um, that really got me thinking about how important it is to to walk the talk and to you know be the example. And how do we start doing that within our own organization? So I'd say about five years ago, we implemented um, a document that we called simply called the pledge. And I'm going to share that with you in a couple slides from now. And um, this pledge basically allowed our staff to share if they had done their advanced directives, if they plan on doing so, um, or simply allow them the opportunity to take the pledge so that um, making that promise for themselves to give that gift to their families to do so at a later time. So we had the entire company complete this pledge, and from that point on, we also um, had any new employee who joined our company take this pledge. And we, our goal was to make it a very normal conversation within our organization and to teach ourselves how to execute um, having these conversations and providing the resources to the community that we serve. So that was something that was just a very natural process for us here at the agency. And then last year, I had a um, an opportunity to um, be part of advocating for the hospice legislative agenda at the U.S. Capitol. And at the congressional briefing that I attended, I was fortunate to meet Mr. Kotkamp and um, Ellen Goodman 
and some other advocates for advanced care planning. And I was, um, you know, inspired. I was, there was a spark. And I thought, well, it's, it's time to continue moving this forward in our organization and extending it to the community. So when I got back to Arizona, we talked about it within our management team, and um, we decided to, in the spirit of hospice and the philosophy of hospice, extend our interdisciplinary model to a, a team that we call the navigators or our quality life care navigators. And we are a group of interdisciplinary members um, who are certified to train um, the community about the importance of having the conversation and sharing your plans with others. Uh, we had this opportunity because of um, a program that our state hospital and healthcare organization um, developed. It's the, our Arizona, it's the Arizona Hospital and Healthcare Association um, invited us to attend a Train the Trainer event. And we sent about 15 of our staff to become certified. Our team is multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary in that our trainers, our advanced care planning advocates and trainers, are social workers, spiritual care coordinators, nurses, liaisons, and certified nursing assistants. The idea behind this was that should we, um, you know, go into the community and say, educate other caregivers and CNAs at a memory care, that we can put someone in front of them that would, they would be most comfortable with, someone who they can relate to, someone who speaks their language, and perhaps um, they might be more enthusiastic and open to learning about, um, advanced care planning and hospice and palliative care and early access to care by starting to have these conversations. So that's that's the concept behind the model is really keeping it aligned to the makeup of hosp the hospice team. Um, so we're extremely grateful to to our state hospital association for paving the way and for the conversation project and National Healthcare Decisions Day for giving us the tools and not, we're not having to reinvent everything. We're allowed to just now go and do the work in the community. So um, what we're doing today for National Healthcare Decisions Day is, is definitely following the theme of leading by example. And um, the week of April 16th, we are providing to the community um, three sessions, three educational sessions um, in our East, Central, and West Valleys. And um, with the recommendations of the Conversation Project and NHDD, it's a truly collaborative model where we've partnered with other community organizations to do this, to provide this education. And um, while we haven't opened it up to the general community, um, our goal is to reach out to other healthcare providers um, so that we can help them lead by example, lead by example, and help educate and have the conversation on advanced care planning with their clients, their residents, and their patients and their staff. So um, you can see here on this slide. We have it set up uh, for April 17, 18, and 19. Um, it is co-sponsored by Dignity Memorial, and so we will have pre-planning specialists there as well, should any of the attendees want to continue um, with other documents beyond their medical power of attorney and their living will. Um, we did put on our uh, materials to provide recognition to our Arizona Hospital and Healthcare Associations program, which is the Thoughtful Life Conversations, of course, the Conversation Project and National Healthcare Decisions Day, so we can help drive the attendees to look at more resources and guidance on those websites as well. Um, something unique, I think, that we're doing is um, not just collaborating with Dignity Memorial, but we have um, selected and partnered with a law firm in each part of the valley to be present at this event. And the idea is that after we provide a, a two-hour educational um, session, 
that the attendees can break out into these smaller workshops um, where they can go up to one of our 15 navigators or to our on-site notary or to the attorney that's present and choose their document of, you know, choose their document and um, complete their advanced directives and at the very least their, their medical power of attorney form on site before they leave the session. And, um, and we're going to be providing materials at these events um, as well as one-on-one um, -on -one Q and A sessions with our partners who are on site. And after these three events, be able to provide the outcomes and share it with all of you. So um, we also have a Spanish-speaking component to this where three of our navigators are bilingual and our materials have been translated um, into Spanish and it's a large population for us here in Arizona and we wanted to make sure that we could reach as many people and so that's, um, we're starting with the bilingual and the bilingual piece with the Spanish-speaking community. So we have that part as well. And um, this is our first campaign executing something of this magnitude for our organization, and we hope to continue it beyond reaching out to the healthcare professionals, but um, that is the population that we're starting off with because we do want to partner with others to make sure we are leading by example and um, that we know what our resources are. So, I didn't, I would like to show you next the slide on what the agenda actually looks like. And this is the one for our central event. Um, it is based off of the training that, again, we received from our Thoughtful Life Conversations, our state hospital organization. And it's called Honoring a Life, Advanced Care Planning Conversations. Our, um, our, model for this event, our Hospice of the West model for this event is take the pledge, have the conversation, express your wishes, and share your plan. And so um, that's what we're hoping to accomplish, and we hope that our model for this campaign will be beneficial to many of you. And um, I didn't include my, I forgot to include my information on the slide, but um, I will make sure to share that through the conversation project. Um, the last slide shows you what our pledge looks like. So this has been adjusted specifically for our events um, in April. But um, what we had implemented internally with our staff looks very similar to this. And again, we have made the conversations about advanced care planning very regular and normal in here. Um, we have taken the very difficult ethical dilemmas and um, situations that we have encountered as hospice professionals, and we are, um, with permission from families, of course, um, with, you know, ensuring that HIPAA is met, um, we are going to be putting case studies together as part of the education that we provide to the community so that we can emphasize how critical it is to complete these documents and to share their to share wishes with providers and family members. So that, that's our campaign and thank you again for allowing me to share. Well thank you so much Rio for sharing and I love how you've teamed up with other partner organizations. So if I think of some of the the takeaways I saw the Arizona Hospital Association and different groups in the chat sharing what they've done. So it's wonderful that you've you kind of partnered with what resources already exist in your community or what we're able to help provide. I love that emphasis on focusing on providers, kind of like put your own oxygen mask on first before you're expected to interact much more with patients or families and yeah. how you uh, how you've made sure that you kind of represent the community that you're in and that you've got translations into Spanish, you've got presenters who can speak Spanish with the group. Um, so that's a really important thing for others to take away from this as well. So thank you so much for um, sharing and people can chime in with questions in the chat. Um, and with that, I want to transition to Rose Allen. And Rose, if you're able to advance the slide one over, we'll have your first slide here. 
Um, and you will be sharing with us what's been going on down in the Miami area. So take it away, Rose. Good afternoon, everyone. It's truly an honor and a privilege to participate in this national initiative. Um, just a little bit about me. I am the director of Baptist Health Bioethics Program. My background is critical care nursing, been a critical care nurse for over 30 years, and have been the director of our bioethics program for the past 15 years. Um, so end of life discussion, challenges has really been part of my entire nursing career. I'm also an EPIC trainer, been a trainer since 20, 2003, so we've been doing our own education on bioethics certified and also board certified in hospice and palliative nursing. So um, we were really excited um, last year um, to join this. A little bit about our, our organization. We are a faith-based nonprofit community health system here in South Florida. We have a um, total of nine hospitals so far, serving from Boynton Beach area to the Florida Keys, our community. Very diverse here in South Florida. We also have a Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute. Um, a Miami Cancer Institute that was open last year, and we um, have urgent care centers, primary care, and emergency care centers. Um, the picture at the bottom is our, our largest hospital in the system. It's Baptist Hospital, 720-bed um, hospital, and we also have a Baptist Children's on that campus. Um, so last year, was our first year for joining. This is our very awesome bioethics um, team. Our medical director is Donna, um, Dr. Anna Viamonte Ross. Um, we have a bioethics coordinator, um, Christina Dozy, that serves two of our hospitals. Patricia McCrink serves um, South Miami and doctors. We have Susan Howard, um, our administrative assistant, but we have a uh, very committed group of ethics committee members across our entire system. Many of them serve voluntarily as um, ethics consultants as well, and these are nurses, chaplains, physicians, social workers, and so many of these have participated in our efforts over the last two years in our um, NHDD initiative. So last year was our first year, and it was quite successful. Um, this was led, um, was coordinated by our palliative educator, Yvonne Patton, and we had great success with many key stakeholders across our organizations who really came forward and supported us. So internally, what we did was um, we worked with our leadership, marketing, um, and um, IT, and so we had a banner on our, our intranet um, page for the week during the, um, it was a, for about three weeks in April. And what that banner did was talked a little, to, little bit about NHDD. Um, we also had links to our bio web, bioethics website. On our website, once they clicked on our website, the conversation starter kit was there. We have also created over the years um, our own advanced directive video, which is a real role-playing video. It's actually on our patient education channel at this moment. Um, it's in English, Spanish, and Creole. So the bioethics um, link, um, the banner also took them to the advanced directive video and other resources such as links to the Conversation Project, NHDD. We also, um, during the week of April, wrote an article in our own organization newsletter, which is our Pineapple Press, and that went out to all our hospitals. Our library director was very involved and engaged, and she also um, distributed to all five locations of our library and display the education packets that we have been giving to all participants, which I'll share in a little while. From a community perspective, we, we wrote an article in our community newsletter that went out to the public 
in all of South Florida. And we did both formal and informal presentations to about nine community groups. And that included a total of 100 participants um, from various areas, churches, homeless, um, various organizations. One of our chaplains host um, on Sunday's uh, Spanish radio um, talk show, and so we had last year our palliative medicine physician who spoke on NHDD last year. So what happened since um, June? So all our efforts um, occurred during April, between April and June, because as we reached out to various um, groups, they really all could not accommodate us during April. And so we were very flexible in coordinating things between April and June. But after June, I was still fired up. Um, I remained very enthusiastic, and this is something, you know, I've been very passionate about doing a lot of, you know, advanced directive education and all our resources that we've developed within our organization. So I just didn't want to stop there. And I found that in just having conversations with our own healthcare professionals, similar to what, um, you know, um, Nathan mentioned and Rhea, that many of them did not have the conversation. Many of our own healthcare professionals, you know, didn't have the conversation, did not complete an advanced directive. They just seemed to think, oh, it's the community who should be doing this. And so I realized then that we were the community and there was a need to empower our own healthcare professionals, which will help them to feel much more comfortable if they walk the walk in having the conversations not only with our patients and families, but even with their own family and friends. And so. Um, I discussed that with our medical director and our team. Um, this was supported by our CME department, and we conducted starting September of last year um, a one and a half hour CME um, education for our own healthcare professionals. And so, what, what it involves is didactics covering the four steps in the conversation starter kit. We also made it a real interactive session um, by using the interactive exercise, the Go Wish game. And this really helped them, I found, to, to, to stop and discern really what are their values. Because we seem to say, oh, you know, you need to think about what are, what are your values and what's most important to you. But I found when, when they were playing this game and they had to answer those questions, that was a ha-ha moment for many of them. Um, we also, in, in this exercise, and this is also what we present to the community, is the um, letter project video from Stanford University, it's really a nice video where people are speaking about having the conversation. And we have our own CAN version of the Florida Statute Advanced Directives, so we also um, discuss that and really go in details about, you know, what is an advanced directive because I've found that even our own healthcare professionals are sometimes very confused about what these documents are. So we spend time doing that. Um, our medical director also goes over coding for providers because our providers are now being paid by Medicare to have these conversations. So we started with just one session and found that our classes were filled and people wanted to have more. So since September of last year, we have conducted um, three sessions. Um, CME sessions offering CME credits, and we've had physicians, nurses, social workers, and many other healthcare professionals who have participated. So a total of 74 have uh, attended um, these sessions. And so our goals are to continue these as quarterly CME um, education. Um, I also, in February of this year, reached out to our retired group of nurses who 
do still come to our organization and participate in events. And I thought, hmm, perhaps I should just talk with them. And I was really surprised when I met with them in February. There were 28 of them. Only 40% already had the conversation. So it was really a wonderful, engaging session with them. And by the end of it, they all realized the importance and um, you know, were going to complete their own documents. So that was really exciting. So this is just sharing um, what our education packet looks like. Um, it's a folder um, that we um, provide. And within that folder, you can see um, um, it's a folder that opens with two pockets. So we do have the conversation um, kit in there. Um, there is actually um, our own advanced directive documents. Um, I have a copy of the Dear Doctor letter from the Stanford website. We have a copy of, of um, links to all the websites, including the Conversation Project NHDD. Um, for the providers, we do provide information on coding and quality documentation on advanced um, care planning. And we really, as I said earlier, spend uh, a little time explaining the importance of each advanced directive document. So, you know, what we provide to the community, um, we spend a little more time with that group explaining various medical terminologies. Um, and we also talk about the challenges with artificial nutrition and hydration, because that's usually um, very personal, especially since we have a very diverse community here. So I do spend a little time talking with them about the risk and benefits, and that it's really a personal choice. Um, in so making this is Kate. Just want to give you a one minute heads up before we have to transition. So thanks for keeping on going. Okay. And so, um, so for 2018, we're planning similar things. This is just showing you some of the list of facilities that we are planning on um, um, educating, both formally and informally. And from an organization standpoint we will be um, doing the same advertising as we did last year. So um, that's just a quick summary of what we're doing here in South Florida at Baptist Health. So thank you for the opportunity to share. And my contact information is on this last slide. Thank you so much for sharing. I love your combination of what you're providing internally to staff, whether that's through a newsletter or a website or different CEU training. There's a lot of great conversation in the chat about different groups doing that um, and how you've seen that go beyond April. This you know, National Healthcare Decisions Day, it's great to have that April holiday, but it should be something that's year-round. So I love that. And then also what you're doing externally. You know, the idea of a chaplain who has the tie to the Spanish-speaking radio program, for those of you on the line, depending on who you're working with, your own team might have connections to different groups around the um, around the region, and so that's a great way to get that going. So with that, thank you, and, and people can keep typing into the chat. Arlene, we're going to hand it over to you to kind of do a quick summary of what's been going on up in Newton, Massachusetts, and so you can use that little right-hand arrow to advance your slides as well. And you may have muted your own phone line, so just want to be sure you can we can hear you. We're not hearing you yet. I'm back in, all right? Perfect. Great. Okay. Um, hello, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Arlene Lowney. I live in Newton, Massachusetts, and I have been here and working in hospice since before the first hospice in Newton was Medicare certified in the early 80s. Began as a volunteer, left the acute care setting, and has never looked back. And I work with Arza Goldstein. I am semi-retired. She is 10 years in hospice. I, as I said, have over 35 years and have been talking about conversations before the crisis, a guide to a better ending for probably 25 to 30 years, walking the talk, and also have had a healthcare proxy for 25 years. 
and all my children knew what my wishes were early on and in the beginning poo pooed me, but they're all obviously very, very committed and understanding now as young parents themselves why this is important. We um, are one year new, so we are very young and I couldn't click the um, answer to your question about how did I learn about this, but it was an invitation from Kate. She was in Boston recently in Cambridge at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and we met there. So it was a thrill, and I'm really um, honored to be here today. I'm trying to move the slides now. Okay. Um, I'm going to tell you just a little bit. We began a year ago uh, coming out of the conversation project training at the Institute of Healthcare Improvement, I met a young woman who is a, also a hospice nurse, and both of us in our talking about the training that we would work on to do four conversation projects in Newton realized we both also had a wish and a dream that we would be able to roll this out across the city and hopefully help to make Newton be a conversation ready city. It's a large community, over 89,000 people, very strong city services, people who are engaged, active, educated, and wanting to make a difference in the life of people across the um, lifespan, not only the elderly. Obviously, we have a larger older, elder population that we also try to serve. Our mission statement is to change the paradigm of living wisely and dying well through education, the arts and humanities, community conversations, and per partnerships. I will today try to focus on how we particularly have engaged the co uh, community and engaged, um, engaged partners in what we're doing. Um, our goals, as I said, were to help Newton become a conversation-ready city. We wanted to create multiple public and semi-private spaces for conversations about end of life care. Had been doing a lot of presentations, but found often it was once or twice, and then we would go on to another either faith-based community or public setting or um, small group in a home, book club, et cetera, things like that. But pulling it together in a way that we could, first of all, gain um, enough people in the community who wanted to buy into this and make it happen. We're now a community of, uh, a committee rather, of about eight people. And we're working on obviously growing the community. We did three trials, um, one new, uh, weekend in November, and we did several things. One was conversation projects, which was very successful. Another one was a wonderful speaker talking about um, aging with wisdom and including talking about dying and using photographs, travel. It was absolutely wonderful and very engaging, st um, standing room only. And the final one was the hello game, which we used, which is a game that comes out of commonpractice.com backslash hello. And it works with the conversation game about living and dying and what matters most. Interestingly here, the young man who developed this game and the website, as I said, was commonpractice.com, was a Newton resident. He's moved to Philadelphia, but we've already connected with him, and we're trying to use this as one of the conversation starters. Often people who don't want to talk about this get very engaged when they're in a game. And it is amazing if you go online and look at the website to look at the amount of energy and excitement and occasional tears, but laughter also, where people are talking about things about what their wishes are, what their experiences are, and how they would like to be involved in this. We found that has been very successful. We um, are working to use, I mentioned arts and humanities before, as another way of opening up spaces for people to be comfortable and talk. So we're using theater, we're using improv, we have another weekend coming up in April, and obviously it being National Healthcare Decisions Day and April 16th, the day that we too want to honor here. Um, we have probably about nine or 10 events that weekend. One of them includes hospice and palliative care panel, both the medical director of the hospice, the director of the palliative care 
service at Newton Wellesley Hospital. Newton Wellesley is supporting this. They are sponsoring us and promoting us in this. And um, I call it one of the best kept secrets in Newton. Most people don't know that there's a palliative care program there. And I use as one example a book club that I belong to, where it's at least three or four of the women have husbands who have some serious health problems, one early Alzheimer's, one Parkinson's, and they have not yet had these conversations with their loved ones. And therefore don't know what their death is going to be like and what the living well until the end of life could look like. So that also gives us an opportunity to open up more conversations and hopefully engage them in thinking about their own health care wishes and values and personal choices that they would want. It also becomes a, a reality that it allows people to learn through this process what the wishes and uh, preferences are of their loved ones. So working hard on this is bringing little bits of um, little opportunities for people to begin to talk about. It often takes two or three opportunities. We are now beginning, because we're returning to places more than once or twice, and in some settings, either a local church or a temple where we've been asked to come and do two or three presentations and include a hello game in it, that we are able to now gather data. I mean, we're just beginning. We're one year new, as I said before. Uh, gather data about how many people had been at a conversation project presentation before. What was their response? Did they actually act on it? Did they have conversations? Did they fill a healthcare proxy? So trying to get data like that, which will really help to inform us and lead us as we go forward in doing this. Um, the other one that we're doing after the hospital panel on hospice and palliative care, the follow-up is going to be which one, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, a uh, presentation which would have been Conversation Project Starter Kit, but I recommended that we do the one how to be and how to choose a healthcare proxy because many people who will tell you they are a healthcare proxy have also told me that they're not comfortable with it. They don't know what their role is, what they'll be asked to do, what kind of questions they might have to answer and or ask the person who's asked them to be a healthcare proxy. So we're beginning to do some work around that with the tools and resources from the conversation project. And we're really glad to have that on board. I'm going to talk a little bit more here about who are our partnerships and sponsors. The um, Good Shepherd Community Care, which was Hospice of Good Shepherd, which is the first Medical Medicare certified hospice in Newton, I returned to over 30 years later. They are our fiduciary responsible partner. So they are supporting the hospital panel, obviously, and um, as is Newton Wellesley Hospital. I have been to the mayor's office, Newton City employees. I've been doing um, conversation project trainings for probably two or three years now and realize that this is something we are now going to develop with the city whereby we can do this on a regular basis, scheduling it with them, and eventually branching out into other parts of the hospital where they are already identifying they can see a need for this. We're at the Newton Senior Services Department, the Newton Senior Center, Council on Aging, and the Newton Needle Chamber of Commerce. I recently began to speak with them because we know that when we talk with employees, this is something that impacts work. If this work isn't done before the person is the caregiver and needs to help make decisions later in life for their loved ones, it impacts productivity, obviously um, absenteeism, a lot of ways in which people are seriously impacted, particularly with the chronic illnesses that so many people are helping to care for their loved ones. Um, others are churches and temples. There are others that we're going to, but I just laid out a few there. We also are at the colleges looking at students and also staff and faculty. So we've been to Boston College, we're working at LaSalle College, and we already have done some presentations at LaSalle Village 
which is a continuing care retirement community. And they are, to my knowledge, the first conversation project grant funded senior living community. I may be wrong with that, Kate, and I don't know it. They may be the second, but they are very interested in what we're doing because we're actually helping them meet their goals and their objectives here. They have an over 200 very high functioning population that are also seeking education. Obviously, we're going to local theaters, um, cinema, art spaces, and um, trying to do death over dinner, death cafes. I'm sure some of you are aware of some of this. And right now, we're in a literally pulling together many, many community areas that people are interested in this. And we believe we have the opportunity to thinking in terms of long-term sustainability is find ways in which we can help different settings, help with the education of whatever their population is. And I did mention um, before, and I may not if I've been thinking about it, but also the caregivers. We're trying to do that in the community, not only the healthcare providers, not only the people at the hospital, but the many, many caregivers are caring in the community as well in um, settings like senior living, assisted living, rest homes, et cetera. But there is um, a movement that's in New York called Doula Givers. And I think it's Suzanne O'Brien, I'm not sure. I think that's the name of the person who's doing this. But there's this effort now to go out into the community as well as in the hospitals and help caregivers, even those who may be getting hospice services but may not know how to do some very basic things that we as providers take for granted and really helping them. The doula givers comes out of the doula movement, which was helping with childbirth. And now it's helping people with the transition into end of life and, um, the, and, op and obviously working for better end of life care. We know that I mean, the this is, oh. Sorry, How I'm am I doing? I'm getting it. close. I'm so yeah, we only have three okay. minutes left on the call. Okay, I'm, I'm going to make pause. it two seconds. Okay. Just okay. Last one up. What are some of our challenges? Funding volunteers. We're trying to grow them. However, other communities beginning to ask how to begin one in our area. We're on our way and know that the opportunities are there and the time is right. And we cannot say thank, enough, thank you enough for all you do to help make this possible. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. And I love hearing the example, you know, over the course of today, we've heard from kind of outpatient, inpatient, totally community-based, volunteer-based groups. I love how you're reaching out to congregations, city employees, that idea of absenteeism is a big one, or even presenteeism, that being a mm -hmm. caretaker can really take people away. Um, the idea of high school students, and, and definitely seeing some interest in the chat about that hello game, and so we've included a link to it. I think one thing that's interesting about that or the conversation starter kit is that those tools end up being really helpful for the general public who may not even have ever thought about this before. They can't sit down with an advanced directive right away because that's very medical or legal. And so using these games or tools that are much more values-based ends up being quite helpful. So we wanted to share these examples with folks. I've loved the questions that are coming um, up into the chat. A couple of things we wanted to just close out with is a heads up of some of the additional calls that we have coming up. Um, we always meet on the third Wednesday of each month and rotate topics. So if you've been interested in some of the things you've heard today and you aren't quite sure how to get started, next month we'll have a call on how to plan for community efforts, kind of a 101. You want to get started, what are some questions to think about? We do virtual speaker training sessions. We often have these highlights. And then another thing, and, and maybe Naomi, you can pop into the chat something to respect about how to register for upcoming community calls. But Another thing that we just wanted to pull out because it's brand new and hot off the presses is that we're going to be offering a free webinar series to engage um, faith communities. So a six-part web-based course on how to do this work within congregations. And so it's open really to anybody who's either in a congregation, you know, clergy, lay leaders, employees, members of a congregation. Maybe you're just a community group that's trying to figure out how to engage more of the congregations in your region. 
And so over six weeks, we'll talk about you know, why this matters, how to incorporate it into the preaching and teaching and pastoral care. We've got examples from all over the country of how to ground this in theology and ethics. Um, so I wanted to include these dates. We've, we've done it in the evenings because we've heard from many folks, especially in congregations, that it is um, hard to join during the daytime. So we've included that. And just as we close up, um, oh, one last thing would be that we can announce the dates of Conversation Sabbath for 2018. So as you're planning your National Healthcare Decisions Day events, you can also be thinking about Conversation Sabbath in the fall. And as we close out, um, just wanted to remind you that as you leave this webinar, you'll be brought to a survey, and we would love to hear from you about whether this fall helps to give you some ideas of of things you could be doing during National Healthcare Decisions Day, if there's other topics that you'd like for us to cover in the future. So we really appreciate your um, feedback on that. And I will stick around on the line and, and watch the chat, but we always like to let people end on time for those of you who have to transition to other calls. So thank you so much for joining us and for your interest in this and a big round of applause and thanks to our presenters to share what you've been doing all over the country. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to clarify to some of the questions. We will send out the PowerPoint slides. We'll send out a recording. And we will also send out um, a summary of the items that were in the chat. Thank you. And to Joan's question, we will definitely archive that face. Um, organization series. So thank you everybody for joining. Glad to have you with us this afternoon. Pleasure. Thank you.